So in this segment, we're going to focus on whether relativism really does give us a plausible explanation of what's going on in cases of disagreement. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to focus on first distinguishing the notion of an assertion being true or the proposition asserted being true from a correct assertion or from the idea that something was asserted correctly. I should say we have occasionally discussed um, the idea that assertion might involve things like knowledge and so on. Those would be obvious ways of saying there's more to correctness than just truth. But we're going to go to sort of set those aside for the moment and just sort of think in terms of not correctness, not in terms of the epistemic status of the person making it, but just sort of the objective status of the assertion itself. Now that might seem kind of paradoxical at first when you think about it, because you might think, well, what is there to the objective status of an assertion beyond just whether the proposition asserted is true or not? And that's a natural thing to say when you're, for instance, in a contextualist framework or you're in a normal way, you have normal ways of thinking about propositions. However, once we start introducing the notion that propositions are true or false relative to different things, like maybe times and context of assessment, it looks like we can actually distinguish the question of whether the proposition is true from the question of whether the assertion is correct. These, there's actually an independent notion of correctness that we can think about. And we have to ask ourselves, well, given that there is this distinction, does the, does the relativist seem to say the right things about whether it was correct or not to assert things? So the best way to try to distinguish between these ideas of truth and correctness is to go back to our temporal example again. So here you'll see that the time we spent on it last week is not necessarily going to be time badly spent. So remember one more time that we're entertaining this idea that propositions can be true or false at different times. So if I say I'm hungry, I express a proposition, David Boylan is hungry, it's tr maybe it was true earlier on, it's obviously not true right now as I'm recording this. Just as a quick aside, I should emphasize again, not, it's not necessarily that everybody accepts this view. Some people do not think that propositions work like this. The important thing is that everybody accepts the coherence of this view, and they can think about you know, what would follow if propositions worked like this. So they may not accept that propositions indeed do work like this, but we can learn some important things by thinking of what would follow if they did work like this. So that's what we're going to do. So again, we'll just accept, we'll go along with the idea for now, that propositions are true or false relative to times. And we'll focus on this proposition, I'm eating, it's true, was true earlier, it's truly, it's not true anymore. So suppose I said, I'm eating earlier on, and now I later on say, uh, I'm not eating. So clearly my proposition I said earlier on is true, and the proposition I said later on is true as well, even though one is the negation of the other, because they're true at different times. But now we can ask the further question, okay, so it's true at the earlier time I said something true, it's true at the later time I said something true, but was I correct in saying what I said? And in particular, it's helpful to, to imagine that you're in the later, you're, you're later on, looking back at what you said earlier. So imagine you yourself said you're earlier on, you said you were hungry. Later on, you're looking back at your earlier utterance and you're thinking about it. You can now see that the proposition that you asserted is false. That proposition is no longer true. Was your assertion correct? When you said, I'm hungry, was the proposition, were you correct in asserting the proposition that you asserted? And it looks like the answer is yes in that case, at least given the natural things we want to say. And the reason we'd want to say it is because it was true at the time that you said it. So even though the proposition that you said is no longer true, your assertion as a whole, we, we would still want to assess it as correct because it was true when you said it. So now notice we, we actually have a, some sort of difference between truth and correctness. I mean, obviously they're related, but, they're not, but they're not, they don't necessarily boil down to precisely the same thing. Because whether the proposition that you said earlier on is true at this time is a different question for whether even at this time you counted as correctly asserting it. Because in the example we're thinking about, 
even though that proposition is no longer true, I would still count you as correctly asserting it. So it can't be that truth and the correctness are exactly the same thing, because here we have a case of correctness without truth. But it's very important to notice that in at least this case at least, the natural thing to say about correctness, about whether you assert it correctly, is that it goes by whether what you said was true when you said it. That's what seems to follow when we think about this temporal case. But now what we got to ask is, well, if that's our model for what's going on when we look at the temporal case, what happens when we start inst instead thinking about relativism? Do we end up saying the same things as relativists about things like knowledge? So I asked you to read the chapter of McFarlane where he talks about disagreement. As you'll see, he goes through a load of different notions about what you might take disagreement to be. But we're going to focus on what he says in the, ver in the second last section when he starts talking about accuracy and joint accuracy. Because these, I think, are the really important things for his project. And they're really important for whether the relativist explanation of the challenge to contextualism really holds up in the end. Because as you'll see, he, he, he mentions the possibility that you could have a view about correctness for knowledge that is analogous to the view about correctness for the temporal case. You might say that even though we have these relativist propositions, whether you count as correctly asserting something um, just depends on the context in which you said it. So you could have a view that says, well, even though the proposition, its truth value varies from, from context of assessment to context of assessment, whether you count as correctly asserting it is not a relative matter. It just depends on whether the proposition was true in the context of assessment it was uttered in. So on this view, even though we have these relative propositions, if Alice says that she knows she has hands, Billy the skeptic should recognise that her assertion is correct, because he should recognise that it's true in the context it was uttered. I mean, one of the reasons McFarlane doesn't really like this is because that doesn't actually seem to gel so well with what we wanted to say about the case of disagreement. If this was our view of how accuracy worked, it wouldn't really sit super well with the rules for um, assertion and denial that we saw earlier on. Because if it was really correct for Alice to assert that she knows she has hands, uh, then why would it be that Billy should be permitted to disagree with her, with, to, to deny her utterance? Because if her assertion was correct, you know, shouldn't he just sort of go along with it? So rather what McFarlane wants to say is that, well, whatever is happening in the temporal case, accuracy for assertions about knowledge is different. Here, accuracy or correctness is a relative matter. Whether you can be correctly asserted to say something goes by the context in which your assertion is being assessed. So if I'm the one saying, I know I have hands and I have low standards, then just as the assertion is true in my context, it will also count as correct in my context. However, for Billy the Skeptic, when Billy the Skeptic is assessing what I've said and saying I know I have hands, he will think that not only is it false, but also it's incorrect because it's not true in his context of assessment. So McFarlane wants to say that when it comes to knowledge, the way that we should understand accuracy is different. We shouldn't understand accuracy or correctness in terms of whether it was true in the context it was said, in the context of assessment it was said, Unlike the temporal case, we should assert whether an assertion was correct by going by its truth value in our context rather than the context in which it was said. And you can see why he needs to say this, as I said, because saying this really was like the temporal case would seem to generate a tension in his view. It would be hard to understand why the rules for assertion and denial were the way they were if correctness was to be understood on the temporal model. This does raise a very important question though, because we saw that it does look very natural in the temporal case to say accuracy is not relative. It's not context of, it's not relative to a context of assessment. Accuracy is, or correctness is entirely determined by when it's said. And the question is, well, why would there be a difference here when it comes to knowledge? Why would accuracy be assessment sensitive in the one case and not assessment sensitive in the other. Is it coherent to think that there could be a difference between these cases? Or should we expect the same to go for all these different kinds of things? Should we think that, well, if we're 
correctness absolutists in the case of time, then we should also be correctness absolutists in the case of knowledge as well. I don't take this to be a knockdown objection, but I do think there's an important question to be answered here, because it is a little bit hard to get your head around the idea that different things would go for different cases. Rather, what seems appealing to me is that what goes for one case goes for all. Either we want to say that a correctness is assessment sensitive in all cases, or it's assessment sensitive in no cases. Um, and if that's right, then it is kind of hard to see really how this explanation of disagreement is going to work without spilling out into other cases. Because if we want to explain what's going on with disagreement in the case of knowledge, then obviously correctness has got to be assessment sensitive. It's hard to see how disagreement would work without it. But do we want to be committed to the idea that if Alan, if I could talk to my earlier self about the proposition that I'm eating, that I would disagree about it? Am I sort of in some sort of disagreement across time with myself about this proposition? Obviously, it's hard to get yourself into a case where you're actually talking to your earlier self, though. Maybe you could imagine you had like a time, a time traveling telephone or something like that. Or you're sh shouting at your earlier self through it, through a time portal. But I don't think we really need to actually generate these odd cases of actually disagreeing with your earlier self to generate the feeling that there doesn't seem to be anything importantly disagreement-like in the temporal case um, in the way that there's something importantly disagreement-like in the knowledge case. These seem to be importantly different. And of course, if that's what we want to say, if we want to say the temporal case is very different um, from the knowledge case, then we have to say, well, the way accuracy works with respect to time would have to be very different to the way it would work for knowledge. And this seems like something of a bullet to bite. It's not really clear why accuracy would work one way in one case and not work that way in the other case. One thing McFarlane does notice here, which is interesting and maybe important, is the idea that in cases of in cases where you're disagreeing about knowledge, or really anything that seems to be relative to a standard, what seems to be going on, the point of the dispute, is you're trying to foist your standards on the person you're talking to. So when Billy is disagreeing with Alice about the claim that she knows her car is parked outside, one thing he's trying to do is push Alice into a context where she shares his standards. And something like that observation does indeed seem correct. However, it's not immediately obvious to me anyway that this really by itself is enough to motivate the idea that there's got to be this important difference between the temporal case and the knowledge case. 